the speakers back to the front, please. And um, from the floor, if you have any other questions that you'd like to put into a debate sort of scenario, so they can be controversial. Um, so the you know the session is around um, trying to modify genomes directly. You can tell not much has been done yet, um, but you know you can raise conceptual questions around where the field sh can or should go, as well as the more immediate pra practical things we've discussed mainly today. So can I have the speakers back up to the front? Okay, do we, do we have any uh, questions from the floor? Don't be shy. Hi guys. Um, so I'm kind of interested in, in combining the, well, what your thoughts would be on combining uh, kind of non uh, CRISPR uh, kind of ways of modifying the genome. So looking at things like um, the, the, the protein eye and, and combining that with things like nanotherapies to kind of um, modify um, gene regulation and things like that um, and kind of maybe a little bit more upstream looking at uh, preventing uh, signal transduction to result in transcription factor activation, whether or not that's, that's also something which we people would be interested in targeting, or is it solely kind of uh, really at the, at the genomic level, um, just kind of conceptually what, what your thoughts on that would be? Okay, um, so the, uh, I introduced a, a new way protein I, I mean, it's a very young technology. Um, I could see in vitro being a discovery tool very useful, but you know, trying to use protein I as a therapy, I think, has even more challenges than uh, genome editing. So at least with genome editing, um, you know, you can transfer nucle nucleic acids uh, to some degree fairly efficiently in viruses. Um, maybe you can, you know, introduce protein I vectors with viruses as well and, and have those as therapies. But if we can translate those protein I shapes into small molecules, I think, for me, that's where I want to focus initially. Um, where I think small molecules don't have all these delivery issues uh, of, you know, large macromolecules. So, you know, there's the issue of uh, druggable targets and then there's the issue of deliverability. And I still see that as a major issue for a genome editing. Now, a uh, person mine right here is working on the delivery issue. So I think it might be more applicable uh, to genome editing straight away. Yeah, I mean, the, this, this, this whole genome editing CRISPR-Cas um, event, is, 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 it, there, there is, by my perception, uh, hopefully I'm not saying anything impolite now, but there, there, it, it, it's, it's quite a hype that I'm observing, actually. There is a clear potential, and it's clearly a step forward uh, when you talk about the tools to modify the molecules and to get hands on a cellular level. Um, in the sense of that we have a better therapy that, let's say, that it would change gene therapy conceptually, I don't see that, that that much because these molecules, they have now a higher specificity, but they're still quite difficult to deliver and many things to be solved. I mean, what people are trying is, you, you made that quite clear in terms of therapeutic application is in the first place an ex vivo thing. You can think about genetically modified food and organisms. This is a, probably a an ethical aspect to this point because as far as I'm informed, you cannot trace back these changes afterwards, so you can actually no longer say that it is a genetically modified organism or food or whatsoever. So at that level, there's, there's great a, change, a, a big change and that deserves the high attention. But in terms of where actually nanomedicine, where I saw the place improving the delivery and these things, it's it's in a sense is another type of passenger or cargo, however you call it. So delivery problems are quite of the same size um, and sort. Yeah. yeah, I mean, these, I agree. I didn't want to say it's a bit hyped because um, <laughs> I don't want to quash enthusiasm. Um, but, you know, delivery issue has been there for many, many years, starting with gene therapy. So, you know, 
this, the only, only difference now is we can correct the genes rather than giving a trans gene. Um, but really, you know, is giving a trans gene necessarily a bad idea either? So, you know, random uh, insertional mutagenesis can be an issue for secondary cancers. Um, so genome editing, modifying what's broken there without a footprint, yes, there's an advantage, but this delivery issue is still such a major yeah. issue. It, it's not really pushing beyond, uh, you know, gene therapy, which has been around for a long time. And your point is excellent that there are many applications from in vitro, which I discussed and Bastian discussed, to um, really society impacted stuff, you know, when it comes to modifying organisms and crops. And, you know, things like um, malaria eradication through gene drives using genome editing is real world stuff. Um, but now that raises a lot of ethical concerns too about release of this stuff. So. Since you mentioned edit, um, <laughs> the eth ethical aspects, um, I'm actually giving a um, paper on genome editing in plants and animals in a conference of the European Society for Agriculture and Food Ethics in September, looking at does it change the ethical perspective in terms of concerns about genome, of what we call genetic modification. Uh, and in that field, I think I rather agree with FDA's view that it's not the same thing as what we have called genetic modification because it's not involving transgenesis. Um, albeit, that doesn't mean it doesn't raise significant issues within what you're actually doing. So in a way, you, you need to focus on, okay, so what have you done and is that a good thing? But I think the fundamental question is where people objected to the idea of switching genes around between species is largely overcome Maybe not completely, but I don't know. But the other thing is it, how much it opens up fields like animal um, applications. I mentioned in my own talk just uh, earlier this morning that um, one area is to be able to do knockouts in large animals like sheep and pigs, which have been very difficult to do by other methods. Um, although cloning technology was a little bit used at, right at the beginning, um, sort of in the aftermath of Dolly the sheep at Roslyn. But, now people like Roslyn are looking at um, to what extent you can use sheep or pigs as knockout models um, in you know, going beyond mice, as it were. So there are a number of, as well as food animals, which can now be modified in ways that previously selective breeding were actually rather better at doing than GM. So the whole range of applications. But can I ask a question about the sort of gene therapy aspect where you're in, still in attempting to do it in somatic cells rather than the problematic area of germline. Yeah, yeah. um, how good is RISPR-Cas in terms of its off-target effects? I mean, I get a, a very, it looks really impressive, but people say almost. Yeah. How almost is almost? So the specificity, I think, isn't it? So the, the wild type Cas9 has indeed some uh, kind of off-target effects. It's not much, uh, but it, it is still there. But um, the high fidelity Cas9, they have um, um, changed the Cas9 protein. They have um, changed the positively charged amino acid from wild type Cas9 and neutralized thyme, and this high fidelity version has. Uh, at least not detectable. The technique uh, possible to detect anymore. So the, it seems that this version, high fidelity Cas9, has uh, no detectable Cas um, off-target effect. Yeah. Um, just in terms of ethical views, I'm I'm also wondering if you turn to if you speak about delivery of these genome editing tools. I guess we should also not rule out the possibility that, as an off-target effect of the delivery, you actually do mutate your germline. Mm -hmm. Which was always a risk in some form of gene therapy. So um, th th this was also a risk with is it one conventional gene therapy that by accident you might actually change germ cells. Yeah. So I mean the unintended consequence remains. Yeah, and, if, and if that restores a disease mutation, I mean, 
I personally wouldn't mind that, but I guess it does raise ethical issues. Yeah, it also depends on the severity. I mean, I've, I've argued in the past that if you've got something like hunting, Huntington's disease, then the risk that you will do something by germline gene therapy worse than the disease is probably quite small, but you might. I mean, you might pass on some subsequent modification that now gives the progeny some disease they would never have otherwise have had. So you know, theoretically, you could imagine. So it then becomes a matter of significant ethical judgment as to whether you think our future generations would say either, how dare you do this, or why didn't you? And, that's not something, and that is an impossible ethical judgment to make. You have to make a decision in this generation, and that's very hard. Um, my question is uh, more general, just in, uh, on a delivery basis. Um, so in terms of getting the, the CRISPR, Cas9, you know, all of that into the cell where it needs to work, uh, I guess the approaches are either you get the plasmid in or you deliver the protein in. Uh, can you comment on either approaches and what have been successful? Um, we we actually went one step back because not delivering the protein, we delivered the messenger RNA to make the cells, to, 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 to give the cell the information to make that protein in situ, so to speak. So the, the cargo to be implemented, that is a plasmid, and for that you need one vehicle. We here use the virus. And then you need that enzyme, and to get this enzyme into the cell, which is actually the protein, which would be protein delivery, which is very difficult in vivo, unless you can do electroporation and other things. So then we had this messenger RNA to make the cells to encode these scissors. So then, can you have a? I, could, I, I referred it to, um, to 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 say it easy, a double gene therapy. There are two types of nucleotides. The plasmid is one thing. And then, actually, you would like to have the protein, but we delivered the messenger RNA. So the cell makes first this protein to transfect the plasmid that it gets, in our case, in the design of the experiment that it had already gotten a week before. So this is no in vivo delivery of zinc finger proteases. It's, it's something that encodes something like that. And then, then delivery becomes more, yeah, works better. And just to follow up to that, is there, um, I understand protein delivery is more difficult, but uh, would that be beneficial uh, if you could right away deliver the protein instead of waiting for the cell to make it? <laughs> well, um, so protein delivery, I, you know, from a purely therapeutic perspective, if you can get an antibody inside of a cell, for example, you could cure almost any disease. Um, but getting biologics through a cell membrane, proteins, uh, it has been tried. There are certain leader sequences you can put on uh, to proteins and might get them translocating across the membrane a bit better. They've been around a while. They work a bit, but not very well and not well enough to be um, useful as therapeutics. So getting enough of your uh, biologic in the right area in therapeutic doses, I just don't quite see it. People are trying, people are trying, but I don't quite see it. Antibodies themselves, once they even got inside of the cell, would break up. So, you know, there's, even if you can get through the cell membrane, not necessarily all biologics will work inside of a cell either. So. On that. So as an analogy, if you look at vaccination, then actually people are doing this, that they are, when, rather than giving the antigen, which is a protein, giving the genetic information to the cells to make themselves the antigen, to, to when, where then antibodies are being formed. So in a sense, it, 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 it makes sense. It's apparently justified by that, but the experience is not that much that you could really tell which works better at the very end. So when you deliver this uh, mRNA together with the guide RNA in your chitosan uh, PLGA particle, uh, I mean, one have to go to the nucleus, the guide RNA, the mRNA have to go to the cytoplasm. Is you just relying on some kind of a distribution there, or have you actually looked into uh, where, uh, where you actually target those RNAs? And, and to, hinting to the other point with the protein, I mean, the problem is also that you need to make the protein from the mRNA before the guide RNA is gone from the nucleus. So it, it's kind of the timing you're... You have to make sure that you have them there at the same yeah. time. Yeah, 
it's, it's ex ex extremely complicated, and to, to do it in a rational way, I must really say we did it in an empirical way. We could say we tried it in the two senses it worked. While, let's say, the delivery of messenger RNA, there is a ra rationale for that. Uh, like for SI RNA, you simply have one biological barrier less when you look at the cells. If you have to go to the nucleus, which was, let's say, all the attempts in cystic fibrosis to deliver plasmic DNA with this, then you have to cross the nuclear membrane to, to go to this machinery. So if you just, in quotes, have to go to the cytoplasm and then the, the two things you have to do is actually getting the, end, the uptake into the cells. There, there are many ways to do that. Uh, endosomal escape, I would also say there are many recipes for that. What we really have to do in, a, in an understandable way is besides the release from the endosome is the release of this cargo from the carrier. I mean, on the one side, we have the binding to the nanoparticle, which protects the messenger R, but then the, on the, the other side also disables any functionality. And then for some reasons, it must be released. And what is the signal? And there is quite a lot of fog and darkness in the scientific understanding how these equilibria are changing, though that suddenly something which is firmly bound at the right moment is apparently released at some space in the, in the, in the cytoplasm. Okay, we have time for one more question, I think. Is there any, any other question from the floor? Uh, we, we haven't touched much on the target ID in the questions, um, so the screening approach. Are there any questions about that? So one person had a question around personalized medicine uh, when Bastian was talking. Um, do we have any sort of you know, questions about personalized medicine? You can see some examples which are truly personalized, like the CAR-Ts, uh, in a sense. Uh, the T cells come from the patient and it's better that they come from the patient, but then what they're engineering is fairly generic. So personalized medicine hasn't really quite happened yet. And you know, what does that really mean? And you know, um, the question to Bastian, um, you know, can he get you know, some very person, how is his stuff going to impact personalized medicine? Well, he's screening uh, tumor suppressors that are fairly common. So you know, we don't have to be completely personalized in all senses. So maybe you know, we can extend that discussion a bit. Um, well, I, I think you said that personalized medicine hasn't really happened yet. I'm, I'm not really entirely sure that I agree with that because there is a couple of targeted agents that are only given when a tumor has a particular mutation or are not given when the tumor has a particular mutation, yeah. right? So in that sense, that is sort of a way of, of personalized medicine. Yeah, but how granular. <laughs> so. Um, that mutation is present in quite a few patients. The same mutation is present in quite a few patients. So, yeah, so the idea of something that's truly personal, um, perhaps one example where we might be truly personal is, well, while one specific mutation in patients might be shared, the combination of mutations can actually be completely unique. And we're not yet giving rational combinations that address unique combinations of uh, mutations. Yeah. So that's, that's the granularity I'm, I'm talking about there. No, you're right. And I, I, I think there will be a, a huge challenge there also in terms of clinical trials, because even if you would find something like that, how are you going to test that, right? Because there is only one patient that has that. Um, yeah. So then you have these, these umbrella trials, of <laughs> just, course. But yeah, just, very, very interesting time. Just to comment on that of yeah, personalized ahead. medicine, I think at least there are so a few companion diagnostics in the market HER2 for, for, for uh, health affecting treatment or mutation of KRAS for uh, Epidox treatment for, for colon cancer. This could be a, a approach for, for precision. Uh, on the other hand, there are a few clinical trials where just checking out uh, circulating tumor DNA for liquid biopsies, which are deciding, at least for lung cancer, if uh, they are going for a kinase inhibitor or switching to uh, taxol based chemotherapies. This could be, though, it's not accepted at all by the, the authorities. But on the other hand, if they are just approaching this kind of, of, of thing, as far as I know. So there are a few people at least. Uh, who wants that one? <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree that there is, a, I mean, but, but that touches upon what you're saying in terms of granularity, right? There is, I think, definitely still a lot of room to further stratify patient categories and be more effective in certain subgroups. Um, but I think that this stratification probably has a sort of a limit, right? You, to, to really get to the personal level, 
with these kind of um, approaches of combining targeted therapeutics, um, I think has its limits. Um, yeah, um, many limits. Um, one limit is we don't have enough good therapies to the right targets to combine yet. And many combinations are just things you have available to combine and not necessarily rational. Uh, but then you touched on it, a major issue is trial design. And perhaps, you know, in the future, there are literally trials of N equals one. Um, if it works in one patient, it works. And, you know, there will be combinations that will work in um, only one patient. But there are many roads yet we have to go down to get that level of granularity to happen in the real world. And, and trial design will catch up, I believe. So I think that's a good point to conclude. I'd like to thank all the speakers and the floor for the great questions and the great session. Thank you. Thank you.